Hello. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Mohamed Ahmedullah, and I'm the Secretary of Brooklyn Circle. I'll very briefly go through this uh, one-page slideshow just to tell you a little bit about Brooklyn Circle and how we started and what we are all about. Um, now, you know, during the 1990s, um, Brooklyn cafes, you know, there used to be a lot of cafes, uh, restaurants, especially on Sundays, but also weekday evening, they used to be really busy. You know, people there talking about politics, having some more and teas and so on. Um, but those days, you know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have uh, much information. And most of the discussion was actually about Bangladesh, you know, about, and about also local issues about Tower Hamlets uh, and Bangladesh politics, you know, going back to partition, going back to 71 and, and so on. Uh, but we didn't have uh, much information those days. And we, we used to uh, look out for Friday issues of Bangladeshi newspapers to arrive on Sunday. So several uh, shops in Brick Lane, they used to sell. Uh, and I used to buy and I filed for about 15 years. Then I had to throw them away, which I shouldn't have. Five newspapers, you know, uh, four English, some daily and some weekly and one Bengali. Um, and then we would read and then, you know, based on developments in the last week, we would have all kinds of discussion. And there were different groups of people. Some knew each other, some didn't know each other, you know, different types of groups. So what, what we did, we decided in order to be able to learn and understand what's going on a bit more, we should actually, you know, undertake some research and then discuss issues in a bit more kind of um, substantial way, you know, based on facts and in information. So each one of us within a group used to volunteer to undertake one month's research on a particular topic and then make presentation and then have a chat. And we did that for a while. Then we stopped. And then 2006, December, we decided that we should do this bit more formally. So we set up a volunteer sector company and from January to March, nine, uh, 2007, we ran our first series of seminars. We called it, as you can see, seminars on Bangladesh and Bangladesh is abroad. And we covered all kinds of topics and we managed to get a lot of interest you know, from, um, from many uh, researchers, scholars, and um, people with expertise in the field. And also 2007 was uh, 250 years of the Battle of Plassey. So we thought, oh, that would be a really great opportunity, good opportunity to try and generate interest um, in history. Uh, so we organized a conference called Battle of, sorry, this is the wrong uh, slide. So this is the wrong leaflet. Yeah. <laughs> this is a project that we developed uh, afterwards, right? But uh, we organized a conference uh, in, July, in June uh, 2007, and we had put interest. And out of the conference, this project, uh, we developed this project. This was to engage young people and about eight young people completed, a lot more joined, but they couldn't, it was too, too intensive for them. And each one of them wrote a chapter in a book researching East India Company uh, assets, you know, buildings and, and so on, and presence in, the, in London, in mainly East, East London. And when we finished that project, we had an exhibition at the Milan Arts Pavilion East India Company exhibition based on the research that these young people did. And one of the participants, a young girl, she said, you know, we learned so much from this project. Why don't we continue, uh, you know, have a Bengal history week every year so that learning process can continue. So that's how we started in 2010, October. And this is the 12th annual Bengal history week. Uh, but this year we extended to uh, a month, you know, mainly because, uh, well, we saw a lot of interest and also we didn't have one last year. And this year is also 50th year of Bangladesh's independence. So we wanted to make a contribution. So we, that's why we are doing this for the whole of uh, October. Next year, we may change it to History Month uh, or go back to History Week. Uh, Brickland Circle, what, what are we all about, right? Um, you know, we want to promote critical thinking and honesty, you know, in relation to knowledge seeking and sharing. Um, we want to promote respect for evidence, you know, and objectivity. 
in our community and a lot of communities, you know, there's too much politicization when it comes to knowledge uh, and communal knowledge, you know, right? Hindu, Muslim, Bengali, Pakistani, you know, all kinds of things, you know. Um, so we wanted to encourage people to go move away from that kind of uh, knowledge. And we try to promote fearlessness, you know. Sometimes, you know, when you engage in knowledge generation sharing, um, there can be consequences, you know, because there's all kinds of uh, things happening in the world. We want to promote fearlessness, but we also want to encourage people in the communities, you know, to link up. Because in the past, we didn't see many academics or many connections between people in the community and people doing the research, right? So we wanted to connect people and encourage people, um, you know, from all kinds of background to try and learn and engage um, or move towards engaging at the cutting edge levels. So this is what we are all about. Before we finish, I'll tell you about the next uh, tomorrow's program. Uh, now I will pass on to uh, Leili. Great, thank you, Adela. It's amazing how long this has been going on and it keeps getting better and better. And I'm actually looking forward to the extension of this to the Bengali, the Bengali History Month. Um, so what I so welcome everyone to the third seminar of the extended Bengali um, Reclaimed Circles um, series. And so the talk today is the changing forms of memory, poems, stories, pamphlets, and songs by Dr. Richard Williams, who's a senior lecturer in South Asian studies at SOAS, the at University of London. I don't know if I introduce myself. Um, my name is Lydia Uddin. I'm a Lever Hume um, Early Career Fellow at the uh, Queen Mary University of London. So what I'll do is I'll just read a brief bio of Richard's and I'll hand it over to him to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll go into Q&A. So Dr. Richard Williams is a cultural historian of music in South Asia. He's particularly interested in understanding how music and sound are explored in literature and how colonialism has reoriented early modern musical ideas and practices. He is currently completing his first monograph on the circulation of uh, musicians, genres, and musicologists between Upper India and Bengal between the 1750s to between 1750 to 1900. His second book project is a cultural history of Ragamala, the art of imagining musical sound through poetry and painting. His wider work has explored the historian, the history of emotions music in Hindu theology and ritual, the performance repertoires of courtesans and music in Pakistani media and literature. His research languages are Hindi, Braj Basha, Bengali and Urdu. I'm going to urge everyone to stay for the talk as well as the q and I think this is going to be a great one. So yeah, enjoy. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Laili. And uh, enormous thanks to Mohammed Akhmadullah for putting this together. Um, it, I've I've been lucky enough to come to a, quite a few of these. This is my first digital one, which is a bit different, but um, I always learn so much from these sessions and it's really absolutely uh, a privilege for me to be able to share my research with, with you all. So thank you everyone for, for coming in this evening. I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. Um, there we go. So hopefully you can all see that. And yeah, very happy to to kind of hear your responses to this material um, after I've finished uh, talking. So um, I'm keen to hear what kind of questions you might have about this. This is very much um, new material that I'm working through at the moment. It's quite different from, from some things that I've worked on in the past. And really I'm engaging with um, some music I heard uh, in West Bengal, in fact, in September 2019. And little did I know that I would not be able to go back to uh, South Asia in 2020. And so I've been thinking a lot about the recordings that I did take pre-pandemic and uh, been trying to think of ways to use them and, and explore them. So at the time in 2019, I was visiting a village called Biborda. Uh, so it's in West Bengal and it's in Bankara district. Uh, here it is on the map. So not super far away from, from Kolkata 
in fact. And while I was there, I was um, the guest of, of one of my friends who's, who's from the village. And he uh, invited lots of people within the community to come and perform. Um, and uh, I, I was there with another ethnomusicologist and we took in a number of, of different recordings and notes and interviewed a lot of the musicians. In particular, uh, we were there for the festival of uh, the goddess Padu, um, who's the goddess of marriage and children. And so at one point, my, uh, my host invited uh, one woman from the village, Lobono Kumbokar, to come and sing examples of, um, of local songs, local songs that were seasonal, that were dedicated to, to this goddess. And this got me thinking, because on the whole, normally I work on Indian classical music. I don't really uh, work on, on the kind of music I was listening to. So I was thinking, how do I how do I think about this music? What, what are the kind of categories that I might use to describe it? And um, in English, of course, we might think of the term folk music. And folk music is something that a lot of people have written about and have sort of torn apart as a category because it's a, it's a messy category with, um, a difficult, with difficult assumptions embedded in that term. So what about ben in Bengali? So when you look at um, works by Bengali music scholars, you see different words. They, they can use words like folk. Sometimes they use the English word folk. Um, of course, you've got terms like lok, so lok gun, lok gun, so kind of people's music, which it's usually doing a similar thing to the English term folk. Um, Bangla gun, a lot of the time authors will just use Banglagan to kind of distinguish it as something regional rather than something um, kind of classical, for example. Um, I particularly like Ancholik, Ancholik Gan, this idea of sort of something a bit local, something a bit more specific and regional. And I think that this is more helpful in many ways to folk. Why, why you might be wondering, am I so worried about the term folk? Well, music, um, in music studies, we've sort of got a number of assumptions embedded in the term folk music which we try to unpick and a lot of these are about the relationship between folk culture and history and basically there are two schools of thought um, when it comes to folk often there's an assumption that something if that a folk song is timeless tradition somehow it's outside of normal historical time it's always old it's always unchanging and so on and then you've got at the opposite extreme, people saying, well, no, folk pretends to be timeless, but in fact, it's often actually quite modern. It, and so this is the idea of invented tradition, the idea that folk songs, well, I mean, if you look at, you know, a lot of um, folk culture in the British Isles, for example, a lot of things that we think of as, you know, very old were actually developed in the 19th century. And so this is where a lot of people get hesitant around the idea of folk. And this is true when you look at scholarship um, on Indian music, on Indian folk culture. So this is a quotation I've pulled out for you. It's a bit of a long one um, by the musicologist Ashok uh, Renade, um, who worked primarily in classical music, but he was a real pioneer of ethnomusicology in India. And so he um, explores some of the associations we might have with folk songs. And he says, when one says that folk music defies chronological placement, one's aim is to stress its all-time appeal. In fact, the anonymity of folk music is to some extent a result of the non-importance of the time dimension. So what he means by this is with classical music, sometimes you'll have the idea that it belongs to a particular artist, a particular composer, um, similarly with popular music, you know that, you know, Beyonce sang that song, etc. someone else didn't. Um, whereas with folk music, it's often somehow anonymous, somehow authorless, and therefore somehow outside of historical time. So he says, when there is a very close and definite connection between music and a particular event, personage or period, the relevant music may make an exit from the permanent musical corpus. So again, what he means here is potentially if you've got a, a folk song about, say, the Battle of Plassey, it could be that after 50 years, people stop singing it because it's not so relevant. Whereas something about um, greeting your sister is something that's much more relatable in all time periods. So he says often 
songs that are too historical get cut out of circulation. So he says folk music is undateable like culture and cannot be described as old or new. And in that sense, it is always contemporary. So I've been going back and forth with some of these ideas and I'm still trying to decide whether or not I agree with them. But while I was thinking about some of these issues, uh, Labano Kambakar, who I was listening to, suddenly um, changed what she was singing. So she'd been singing songs, like I say, dedicated to the goddess whose festival was on at the time. But then she started um, reciting a text uh, from memory, all from memory, nothing in front of her, um, about events from the late 18th century. Now, she, she actually recited for a very long time. And, and again, her memory was really incredible. Um, but I'm just going to play a short fragment just so you can hear um, from the recording that day. <laughs> Right, very short fragment, sorry, but just to give you a taste of it. Um, so she was reciting from memory a poem about modern Mohan, um, a form of the god Krishna who's intimately associated with nearby Vishnupur, where he had once been consecrated as the protecting deity of the kingdom. And this poem tells the story of how the god Modern Mohan appears in Bengal and it weaves together stories about devotees who went in search, um, in search of him and it has uh, accounts of miracles and then it also crucially laments his leaving the kingdom of Bishnupur and moving to Kolkata. And this recitation really stood out to me um, because I'd come across this story before um, when I was doing historical research on Bishnupur and I was reading about these events in a, a late 18th century poem by the poet Joy Krishna Das, uh, the modern, uh, modern Mohana Bondana. Uh, so the salutation to modern Mohan. And uh, this hasn't been published uh, before this text, but so I was using a manuscript that's in the Asiatic Society archive in Kolkata. So there I was in 2019, and we were listening to all of these folk, folk songs when suddenly I think, oh, I've heard this text before, but it's coming from a manuscript that I've consulted in an archive. Both the poem and Lobono's uh, telling identify a salt merchant from Kolkata who was called Gokul Chondro Mitro and says that he was responsible for the gods leaving Vishnupur, which in turn led to the downfall of the kingdom. And these events had been very painful when they'd originally unfolded in the 1780s and had been commented upon in lots of different colonial sources in the mid in the mid 19th century. So in the 1800s. And so I, I was, again, surprised to be hearing about them yet again, but now in a completely different setting. So when uh, Lobono Kambakar finished, I asked where these lyrics came from and, you know, was this part in the back of my mind, was this part of this authorless, anonymous, oral tradition that Renade, that Renade, that Ranade, sorry, was referring to? And, and, you know, some people I was with said, oh, no, you know, there, there are no authors for this. It's just, um, it's from memory, it's oral transmission. And she said, no, no, actually, it's from a text, uh, um, a personal songbook that she had in her collection at home. And so she'd um, memorized this, the Ashal Modern Mohana Adi Mahatma. So the true and original greatness of Modern Mohan. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explore the history of Modern Mohan, the god of Bishnupur, and think through how it's been told, retold and archived as poetry, performed recitations, and also as briefly as colonial administrative documents. Um, so I'm writing this up at the moment. It, it's going to be an article, and so I'm preparing it for publication where I get very theoretical and talk about what this means for time. I'm not going to do that here because it's quite late in the day and no one wants to have too much theory. So instead, I'm just really going to try and talk you through the detective work I try to do of joining the dots between these different tellings, because I think it tells a very interesting story about how 
people remember quite distant removed events um, going back to the 1780s. So what's the story? So Modern Mohan, the former Krishna, was the principal deity of the Mala kingdom of Bishnupur, and he was consecrated in Bishnupur in the 1690s um, by Raja Durjan Singh. And in particular, he's remembered for protecting Bishnupur from the raids led by the Marathas in 1740, when it said he personally fired two cannons against the invaders. And when you go to Bishnupur, there, there is a large um, antique cannon um, out on display. And, you know, th these are the stories people tell about these very cannons. These are the ones that the gods used. However, Modern Mohan soon became embroiled in a dispute between two claimants for the throne. So there was a power struggle between uh, the Raja, Chaitanya uh, Shinghodev, and the Modar Shinghodev. And they were um, for competing for the throne in true kind of Game of Thrones style between the 1750s and 1790s. And so Demodo, who was trying to get hold of the throne, went to Mashidabad and he tried to get help from the Nawabs. And in the end, he succeeded in pushing Choitano out of his fort. Um, Choitano then fled to Kolkata and he took the god with him. He took the image of the god Modern Mohan with him. And there he struggled financially and he ended up in debtor's prison in 1775. Now, at this time, this is when colonialism kicks in. So at this time, Bishnupur had fallen under the jurisdiction of the East India Company. Um, and so Chaitano pawned Modern Mohan to a salt merchant called Gokul Chondramitra. So he basically gave it to him on loan to procure the services of someone who would be able to intercede for him um, with the company's government in Bengal. So basically he needed the money to get a divan to um, intercede on his behalf with the East India Company. So he pawns the god to the salt merchant Gokul Chandra. And the accounts of this story, in fact, vary a lot in the details. It's not clear whether the god was pawned for one or three lakh rupees. Uh, the numbers will vary. Um, it said that when Chaitanya returned to reclaim the deity and, and pay off his debt, Gokul Chandra Mitra had already installed uh, Madan Mohan in a temple um, on Upper Chitpur Road in Kolkata. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, so the Supreme Court uh, got involved and they ruled in favour of Chaitanya and said, no, the gods should go back to Vishnupur, but Mitro returned a copy instead. And the original modern Mohan remained in Gokul Chandra's house in his family temple in Bagbaza. So the art historian Pika Ghosh has written extensively on this story as well. And she demonstrates that these events have persisted in memory and poetry over the centuries, but each record has a very different texture and emphasis creating and, and telling different meanings attached to the actors involved. So what was I listening to? Well, Le Bono Kombokar's version um, is influenced by her own concerns. Remember, she's reciting this from memory. And when I went back and forth looking at the text, I could see that there were some areas she remembered more vividly than others and so on. Um, and she had learned the text uh, by heart from this paper booklet. And uh, she told me that she collects and preserves these texts because she enjoys singing and reciting, but also because um, performing these texts and studying them brings, brings spiritual merit, auspicious merit. And in fact, in Bishnupur, where people sell these booklets and tell, that tell the story um, for eight rupees, by the way, um, the, they tell their customers that they should be reciting this work every morning um, to, 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 to grow spiritual merit. Uh, this text in, in the booklet um, has a complicated story, it turns out. It opens with a short mantra, but the rest of the work is composed in, in couplets in an archaic form of Bengali. And the illustrated booklet does not come with any date or a named author. So I had to do a bit of digging. The earliest concrete source we have for this story is that manuscript I was talking about, the modern Mohan uh, Bondana. Um, 
And we've got copies of this from the 19th century, from 1820 and 1861. But the original text, I think, was much earlier, sort of in the 1780s, probably. So this text um, was written by Joyal Krishna Das, who appears to be responding directly to the crisis that the god has left, that he has left Bishnupur and is apparently choosing to remain in Kolkata. So the work is something that praises the god, but it's also a petition. And it's imploring modern Mohan to come back to Bishnupur. So this is, this is my translation from one section of it, where he's talking about how Bishnupur is, is desolated without the god being present. So he says, no flag flutters above your blessed temple any longer. Woe, woe, modern Mohan, the king and his people are crying out. In a moment, the Lord broke up the entire market of love. Without you, the blessed temple's door is shut. There is no Rasa or Holi. No more pilgrims come. How much love has Gokul Mitra, the salt merchant, shackled you with in, in Kolkata? That day, when they hear modern Mohan has crossed the Ganges, the people of Bishnupur will perform Nam Shom Kirtan. That day, when you have mercy and come to sit in your own kingdom, the king of this land will bring you home and fire the cannons from the guts. With every word, the king and his people will shout, hail, hail. Uh, so joy, joy. Sorry, in English, it sounds silly. Um, joy, joy. Uh, every heart will remain fixed upon your feet. Come and reside in your temple. Increase our joy. Joy Krishna Das implores you in the hope of your feet. Um, so taking refuge in the feet of God, by the way. Um, so the work is chiefly concerned with modern Mohan's personal connections to the king and the kingdom of Bishnupur, including his personally fending off the Marathas in 1740. So what, what the poet does, remember, he's petitioning God and he's saying, we have a long relationship. You have been tied to Bishnupur for a long time. Remember when you saved us from the Marathas? So he goes through all of these events. Um, so this sort of makes the, the sudden disappearance of, of the deity e extra traumatic. It's a real, it's a loss. It's a betrayal. It's a very personal account in here. The text doesn't go into details about why the god left. So it doesn't talk about the royal family's feud over the throne or the desperate mortgaging of the image of God. And again, it's probably because Joy Krishna Das was based in Bishnupur. He may have been a court poet. So he may have actually been taking money from the royal family. So he didn't want to offend them by sort of airing their, their family troubles in public in poetry. Um, so instead, what we get is that the disappearance of modern Mohan um, is part of a whole series of disappearances, reappearances, revelations, as, as the god Krishna, who, who is very mischievous with his devotees, moves in and out of their lives. At the same time, the poet explicitly asks why the deity would choose to remain with Gokul Mitra in Kolkata, um, which locates the historic loss of modern Mohan in a very specific way. So uh, here's, here's a picture I took of Gokul Mitra's um, family home in Kolkata. So, so once Gokul Mitra had taken custodianship of modern Mohan and erected a new temple for him in Kolkata, he and his descendants became the deity's new um, Shivites, so the people who, who serve him in, in the temple and look after him. Um, it, was in his in, it was in his interest, i.e. Gokul Mitra, it was in Gokul Mitra's own interest to present his own aversion of events, presumably to avoid being publicly criticised because you have everyone saying Vishnupur is desolate because of what Gokul Mitra has done. So he, he put his own spin on things. So he or someone in his family commissioned a retelling of the story and gives a different account of how the god ended up moving house to Kolkata. And this is in the form of a biographic poem which focuses on Gokul Chandra Mitra himself as the ideal pious man. So this is the Shadu Gokul Mitra Jibani, Jibani, sorry, Jibani. So the life, the Jibani of pious Gokul Mitra. And this, again, we're not entirely clear who wrote this, but a very, very established story is that the poet was Ron Prashad Sen, um, who apparently was at some point um, working for the Mitras. And 
personally, I think this is very difficult to, to verify. Um, it's quite likely that Ron Prashad himself may have died before all of these events happened. And certainly this text is very Boishnob, um, whereas on the whole, Ron Prashad Sen is you know, famous for his songs to the goddess and his Shakta poetry. So to me, it's not an obvious fit at all. But what do I know? I could be wrong. It's also possible that there's been a confusion that there was another poet called Ron Prashad Sen, um, because there was another Ron Prashad Sen who was about the same time. So it's possible the two figures have, have been converged. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because this attribution was very powerful. And for a long time, people thought this text um, belonged to Ron Prashad Sen, and that made it very popular. And people started singing it. And in fact, we hear that a number of itinerant singers went around singing this text, the Shadu Gokul Mitra Jiboni, because it was associated with Ron Prashad Sen. And it's a good story. So whoever the author was, he presumably a he, but you never know. Um, they um, directly borrowed phrases from that earlier text, the one in the manuscript, um, but they reframed them. So what you have in this section is the plea that I just had, the plea where the poet was saying, please come back. There are no festivals, everything's desolate, but when you come back, we'll sing, etc." They take that, but they put it into the mouth of the queen. So there's a whole extra framing that comes in. So, um, so here on my slide, the bit in this whole text is in the the life, the Jubani, um, but the bit in red is borrowed from the manuscript. So, what's the story now? Coming to Bag Bazaar, the Lord has now settled down there. The blessed temple of Bishnupur is tumbling down. The king weeps, the queen weeps, their subjects are weeping. The priests and Brahmins weep and fall unconscious. The elephants weep in the elephant stables. The horses won't drink water. Gopal Shingho's queen weeps and bewails. There is no rasa, there is no holy, no more pilgrims come. How much love has Gopal Mitra shackled you with now? So exact quotation from the original text, but now embedded in this larger, more dramatic story. I particularly like the idea of the weeping elephants. I think that's a nice touch. Um, so... The rest of the text then explains about why Gokul Mitro is the ideal home for Bishnupur. So here the question is asked and the rest of the text explains. So this is where it gets a bit complicated. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't feel guilty if you zone out of this bit. But modern Mohan had become embroiled in a new story in Kolkata. And in particular, he focuses his, the God focuses his affection and, and compassion on a woman he meets in Gokul Chandra's house. And he appears before her in disguise and mischief, mischievously gives her, her his flute. And so there's a whole series of extra uh, adventures in Kolkata. And the following day, when she restores the missing flute to the image of God in the temple, she brings to a close a complicated tale that has unfolded over many rebirths. It turns out she was once a heavenly nymph, an, ups an apsara called Chandrabali, who had made a sharp remark once at Radha's expense. So she was cursed to take a lowly birth. And in true sort of epic Puranic style, she has cycled through worldly time until that moment when the god modern Mohan was in Kolkata, could encounter her again and liberate her soul. So actually his being there was part of this much larger uh, explanatory story that had gone on over many lifetimes. Similarly, the same thing is there for uh, about the merchant himself. So drawing on Jai Krishna Das's poem again, here we hear about how the Marathas invaded Bengal, but then were re repelled by the god when he took charge of Bishnupur's defences. I love this bit. So here we have the text again. So um, modern Mohan tucked those two cannons under his armpits and with two hands he lit the two wicks of the cannons. Trees and stones were blasted by the sounds of the cannons and in one battle how many hundreds of Marathas were killed. So having finished off the invaders, modern Mohan leaves for his temple but on the way he meets a cowherd and asks him for some curds since he's hungry after, you know, firing these cannons. And the cowherd mistakes the god for a common soldier and is reluctant to give away his products. But modern Mohan says, no, no, I'm the son of the king of Bishnupur and he'll settle my bill. 
So then the narrator steps in and explains how, again, this conversation, this interaction was actually part of a much larger, older constellation of events that had spread across several cycles of births. So we're now talking about the cow herd who gave him the curds. In an earlier life, his name was Keshav Bharti. In Bishnupur, he took the guise of a cow herd. That cow herd was then born in Bagbazar, and he became known as Gokul Mitra. So, so Gokul Mitra is part of the Bishnupur story, in fact. He is, we are told, an incarnation of Keshav Bharti, who is very important for the Gaudias because he initiated Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as, a, as an ascetic in 1510. So he, this very important spiritual figure for the Boishnobs, had reincarnated as the cowherd, had the interaction with modern Mohan, reincarnates again, but this time as a salt merchant, who ends up with the god again. So this text gives a new context to that original complaint um, from the poet in Bishnupur. Madan Mohan deserted um, the kingdom in favor of Kolkata, but it's all just part of a much grander story spanning multiple lifetimes. So this history then gets condensed in this tale, the life, the jiboni of Gokul Mitra, and it ends with a call to all devotees, whether in Bishnupur or in Kolkata, to perform the God's service for eternity. So where does this leave us? So the, the uh, Shadul Gokul Mitra Jiboni was the source text for the retelling in Lobano Kumbhakar's booklet. So I've been comparing the two and there are very close correspondences throughout, though the language and plot is often simplified in the latter. So it's quite likely that this version, the one I heard, was in fact based on a popular retelling of the Jiboni that was adapted by those singers, those itinerant singers over time. So there's a sort of missing link of orality there. And the Mahatma version has some specific qualities. Um, in some passages, we hear a new voice coming in who passes judgment on the king of Bishnupur. And like I said, the original poet back in the manuscript, Joy Krishna Das, didn't criticize the ruler. In the Jibani, the weeping king is sort of excused. He's part of a larger mythological explanation. Um, but here in this popular version, the Mahatma, the, um, it's the God's idea that the king should mortgage him, but he's kind of testing him. And the king was idiotic to take him at his word. So here we get a new voice coming in, judging the king. So he says, one day the Maharaja fell into trouble. He became anxious over three lakh rupees. Madan Mohan says, King, listen to me carefully. Why are you fretting so much over three lakh rupees? Go to Gokul Mitra's house and pawn me. He can, take, he can give you as much money as you can take, O King. Casting intelligence aside, the Raja was foolish. Taking the heavenly hurry with him, he went to get a mortgage. So this kind of judgment adds entertainment value to the narrative. So apart from misguided kings, we also hear about confused Brahmins and puzzled priests who are all toyed with by, by the god. And on one occasion, the god encourages the king to pursue a lawsuit to assert his custody rights. So we get um, this kind of entertaining scene in a law court where God goes to court. So uh, Takur, um, the God said, Raja, why are you going back? Quickly, go put in a petition at Alipur. So wearing a pugri, I will go to the courthouse. I'll call myself Modern the lawyer, uh, the vakil and, vakil, and I will have it recorded. So hearing these words, the Raja went quickly and then submitted to Alipur into the courthouse at Alipur. The Lord... There we go. Um, so the Lord Madan Mohan was dressed as a lawyer. He went to the court and gave darshan there. The judge, and here in the Bangla text, we get all the English words. So the judge and magistrate were dumbstruck. They were unable to speak when he said his name. My name is Modern the lawyer. My home is Bishnupur. So again, we have this whole sort of farcical scene where God pretends to be a lawyer. And we get lots of um, 
yep, so we, we get this comedy coming through at the expense of figures of authority. And I think in the setting of village recitations and songs, we might interpret these hapless characters as jokes at the expense of the upper castes and upper classes. We can also hear in these repetitions the convenient units for it improvising and remembering long narrative poems because the, these are long poems but it has these very clear um, funny stories and chapters to it so just skipping a little but just to say that this story pops up in english accounts as well it pops up um, in hunter's uh, annals of rural bengal and it also appears in lots of different administrative documents, which I won't go into. But again, what's interesting, of course, about these accounts is what I call history without active gods. So in these other stories, Modern Mohan is the main player. He's the one who's calling the shots. He's got a lot of agency. Of course, that doesn't work for a 19th century English history. So instead, it's very much um, an idol. Here, here he's even called a remnant of Aboriginal worship. So it's quite, it's quite a different way of talking. And aspects of this, I'd argue, do go through. I mean, this is a translation from a contemporary, very, very excellent um, piece I found online on a, in a Bengali blog, which is talking about this as well by Otanu Kumar. And it, it's a great uh, piece. But again, there are assumptions about how, how history works. So he says, in this kind of verse, um, pod, podo and panchali, sung narrative although the royal devotion and, and otherworldliness is obvious it goes without saying that within all this many historical things lie hidden so again this idea that we can kind of extract history from these things but perhaps some of the frameworks that people were using of explaining things through multiple births etc through active gods who have decisions about where they want to go some of this doesn't work so i'm quite interested in in how in different forms of the telling um, we have to sort of change the worldview we have so i'll finish in a second but just very briefly um what the missing story the missing chapter in in this story happens in the early 1900s when all of this gets re-remembered in a new way um, because of Gokul Mitro's great-grandson Bihari Lal Mitro. Um, so between 1906 and 1910 you get a whole set of articles about Bihari Lal who's called one of the wealthiest and most charitable of the commercial zamindars and author of some repute who's written sanely and forcibly on Swadeshi and learnedly on Vedanta philosophy. So this is very interesting what's going on here. So basically, Bihar um, Mitra was a scholar. He, trans he translated a big Sanskrit text. There we go. Um, and at the same time, he donated liberally to a number of public works. And he also took a very strong anti-boycott stance on the Swadeshi movement. So a lot of the powers that be who didn't want the, the boycotts to go through sort of raised him up as, as, you know, the ultimate example of how people should be thinking in Kolkata. So these newspaper reports about him were directly responding to his politics, but they were also invoking a kind of cyclical sense of time and making a connection between him and his illustrious ancestor, Gokul Mitra. So, he, so here we have um, a couple of quotations, the essential kindliness and simplicity of Babu, uh, Bihari Lal Mitra, his business acumen, his religion and spirituality, his literary incli inclinations, as well as his charity and wealth are derived directly from Shadul Gokul. And the century and a half that lies between them serves but to accentuate the, the likeness and then the claims get a bit bigger and they talk about his modernity, but it says in many ways, he's like the, um, the great men of the noble and princely mercantile families of Florence and of Venice in the time of their glory. He has shown how it is possible to take the best of the new and use it well and wisely without at the same time losing any of the best of the old. So I suppose what I'm interested in here is again, this, the claims that are being made about the present by invoking particular kinds of history, the history of his ancestor, Gokul Mitra, who again, as we've seen, gets caught up in all kinds of earlier histories, framings of time, but also here in this global context, 
as a sort of Renaissance prince in Florence and Venice as well. And so there are all of these long durée kind of claims being made about him, about how this story is going. Um, and it was in this period that he cemented the connection to modern Mohan. Uh, the text about the Jibuni gets printed and he holds a huge um, festival within the family temple um, where apparently thousands came to be fed. So let me see. I think I'll just conclude here. Um, so traditions of remembering, like the one I heard that day from Lobono Kumbakar, I would say are, are cultures of memory, cultures of memory that are perfected for particular contexts. And this particular culture of memory is, is situated in the sense that the transmitted histories are designed to be recited. They're designed to be sung primarily in domestic settings. And they're there because of their artistic value and the pleasure they bring to the people who listen to them and, and perform them, but also for their spiritual value as well. And this makes the form of the history obviously different from a text like the colonial archives I was talking about, or the kinds of work where you sit and you silently read it. Um, so in my longer exploration of this, I talk more about actually how this is performed and what that means to have a kind of lived live performance of something. And this domesticity of history, bringing the stories of kind of big events but into the, the stories of families and then into the home through these recitations. It connects the activation of the 18th century to other practices involving time, such as rituals, festivals, auspicious days and life rites. And I would say that on the whole, these practices create opportunities for their participants, for the people who listen to them, who perform them, to sort of step out of ordinary time and to think in terms of these much longer periods, whether it's back to a Renaissance past, or whether it's back to uh, the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or back to the 18th century, people can think outside and also think in terms of the eternal time of the God, of course, the godly time. So, uh, so again, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where I stand on that original quotation about folk culture being divorced from historical time, being somehow anonymous and as I keep thinking about this, you know, what I find really striking is actually this isn't an anonymous text at all. This is something that where we can retrace the steps and we've got the text, but we also have the, the, the oral performance. We still have people committing this to memory. And it's nice for me um, on a sort of you know, nerdy level to be able to see how specific historical moments have shaped the narrative and have impacted on it and changed the framing, the story, and the explanations for why modern Mohan left Bishnupur. So I'll finish there, but thank you so much for listening. And yeah, really interested to hear if you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. So thank you. Great, thanks Richard. That is excellent. There's so much, I mean, great detective work for me. And I mean, there's so much to chew on here when we're thinking about role of memory in sort of history, um, whether, you know, the circulation of memory over time, space, and the many different forms, the connections, um, and sort of divergences or departures between those different forms, the role of gender and memory. And I think one of the things that came to me, struck me actually was, what was really interesting about it is the relationship between God and his devotees and whether God actually has any kind of autonomy in our memories itself is there actually so I mean there's so much um to go with and I um and we're going to go into Q and A's but and I I think what will happen now is that I'm going to wait for hands if you could just show your hands um using there's a button here somewhere right in the reactions um if you sort of if you have a question and you want to ask them if you could just show hands but whilst or, or everyone, you can type it in the chat as well or you can um, type it in the chat speak, so yeah free to type um and yeah whilst everyone gathers the thoughts i thought i might ask a question about labonno actually i wanted mm -hmm. to hear more about sort of how she's remembering mother Mohan and whether she's actually adding anything to this memory itself 
Um, I'm just wondering with every iteration or every memory itself, whether there's anything that's, uh, you know, that's happening where, you know, where is her agency in this retelling of this story? Where does she fit into this history? Um, I do have another question. Um, so I'll just ask that, but feel free to ignore the question if we, um, and whether historians can actually think about memory outside of the material itself, the material object, because what we're seeing here is that you're thinking of memory through texts, through recordings of Le Bonno, or I mean, I mean, I know that she's recited to you, but I mean, I'm assuming you recorded her in order to remember what she said. So whether historians can think, is memory just simply a material object that historians, um, and is that how historians should think about it? Um, mm. Those... Shall we start with those? Yeah, um, start with those, and then I'll just wait for other questions to come. We'll great. take other questions. Yep. Thank you. Those are both really, ooh, um, really interesting questions. So um, the first one about Lobano Kumbakar herself. So, um, yes, this is something. So at the time, I was taking in so much in the border, and I learned so much there, and it was only afterwards when I got home that I thought, Oh, okay, actually, now I'm digesting it. I can see that there's a lot, a lot to do here. So my plan was to rush back to Biborda last year and to spend more time with her. Of course, I haven't been back to Biborda yet because of the pandemic. So my plan is to try and get back and, and hopefully talk to her. So Lobano Kombakar is very interesting. I, so she's the wife of, of the potter in the village. And so he was very busy at this time because he was preparing murtis for, for the goddess Badu, for her pujo. Um, and she does, and like I say, I mean, it was it was a real honor to to watch her use her memory this way. Um, I think I think increasingly, you know, we all have terrible memories, and it was just wonderful. It was a real privilege to see how much she could excavate from from her memory banks. Um, and so, yes, so where does her agency come in in the performance? It's partly, of course, things about, you know, she chooses what to memorize, she chooses what to perform. She also will make connections about, you know, um, about repertoire. So we had originally asked her to perform Badugan, but then she turned to this, etc. But what really struck me was when I was looking, comparing my recordings with, with the text, of her booklet. It's interesting to see the bits that perhaps she just didn't remember that day, or mm. perhaps the bits that weren't so important. Because for example, one bit where she sort of jumps a page is the whole section, I think, if I'm remembering this correctly, about, um, about the Marathas invading and the whole scene with the cannons and the, the Kurds, etc. And that in the text, is really important. That's a very, very important scene. And in Bishnupur, this is something that people really think about a lot. You know, it, Modern Mohan's most famous for firing cannons at the Marathas. That's his big, his big story. Um, but yeah, in this, those whole sections sort of kind of skip her mind a little, um, which I think is really interesting because it could be a coincidence in that performance, or it could be that actually um the priorities of some of the poets and writers aren't the priorities of the performer and she was more interested in some of the other sections so again you can kind of do that kind of uh, analysis of what of how she was performing but to be honest i mean i haven't brought her very heavily into this presentation because mm -hmm. i haven't done enough work with her and so right. i haven't spoken to her enough to kind of really get a proper understanding so I don't want to speak for her so yeah. I haven't I have, I've been a bit careful but at the same time this relates to your second question about mm -hmm. memory and the memory outside the material and that's actually hugely valuable that point because of course you know a lot of this is about memory and the reason I was thinking about memory is because she was doing it all from memory mm -hmm. my intervention here is someone studying the material is going back to records my my experience isn't really about memory mm -hmm. my own experience in this my own work in this is very much about text and recordings mm -hmm. and like you say my recording of her song is a text basically which i'm studying and 
this work that I've presented now, you know, quite quickly, it took me a very long time because, you know, my bungler is not great. And so it took me a long time to listen to her recordings and figure out, okay, what, what is she performing here? Mm -hmm. And then going through the text and then doing the comparisons and then translating everything as I go. So actually in some way, you know, what I'm doing here is, just in a completely different lane of the motorway, really, you know, she's going super fast and has this material at her fingertips at, at, in her memory. And my studying the memory is very slow, very text oriented. And in that sense, quite removed from that initial live experience. But I think that's inevitable, but it's just, it's yeah. important to flag it up. So thank you for, for bringing that up as a question. Okay, um, we do have some questions and chat there's Shahida and Sharad um can you see them uh, yes I? so yeah. I think Shahida, Shahida's one is around sort of where Vishnupur is and yeah. about travels to select yes um, I'm afraid I'm afraid I haven't been to select just to do that quickly I really want to go and um, I'm really hoping to to at some stage inshallah but no I haven't I haven't been yet and again last year I was hoping to go to Bangladesh but we'll have to wait for that um and Bishnupur Bishnupur isn't in Kolkata but it's not far away it's it's a few hours on the train just outside Kolkata so there's sort of um it's quite close to Biborda village which is where I was listening to this um but yeah it's just outside Kolkata and then we have Masharat saying, thanks Richard, how does the real events in society shape or change the content of the recitations itself? Or what's the impact of the, yeah. I guess, the context? Mm. Exactly. That's interesting. Um, yes, that is a, that's a good question. So there's the recitations and then there are the, the texts as well. So actually, it's two different things. So yeah, here, I've mostly focused on how real events in society are, are impacting on the texts themselves. So, you know, I read this as um, the complaint of the poet who's left in Bishnupur, and then the merchant who puts his own spin on things, and then his great grandson who is trying to, you know, set up his own credentials, and then the people who take that story and sell it for eight rupees for for for, for pilgrims who, who can access this. And so that's the, the version I heard. In terms of how social events, social history impacts on all the recitations themselves, the live performance, I mean, that's that's a lot harder. And basically it's tricky for me to answer because I just haven't listened to enough different recordings or performances, live performances of it. Um, but like I say, I think it is often the effect of the kind of choices or conscious or otherwise of, of the performer. The fact that Le Bonnell skips a page at a time. Was it a coincidence? Maybe she was, you know, just racking her brain that day. Or was that a decision that she said, actually, that's not the bit I'm most excited about? Yeah. Great. Um, I think Tom has a question. If you can. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hi Rich. <laughs> How are you doing? You're right. Fantastic talk. Um, it got me really excited about some things in my research, actually. Um, but the question is really about this anonymity um, mm -hmm. thing that's going on in folk music or the way that people talk about folk music. Um, it struck me because a couple of people that are turning up, uh, a couple of historical figures that are turning up in my research, um, have really become very prominent public ideas and um, quite quite the opposite to the way that you're suggesting this text has been portrayed. Um, and certainly in my context, there have been obvious um, political movements around why those people have become popular figureheads. And I was wondering whether maybe there was a kind of political or social benefit um, to kind of maintaining the anonymity of the authors in a social way uh, in your context. I don't know if I've missed something that you said, but um, yeah, that's the question. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. That's a, that's a very 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. And it actually goes back, in fact, to the last question as well about how did the larger kind of social events um, impact on these recitations? In this case, how, do, how does the larger context shape what gets remembered, what gets kept, what goes anonymous? Um, and in particular, if we think back to that quotation Tom's talking about in the beginning, there's this idea that if it's anonymous, it's more likely to stick around. Whereas if it talks about a historical figure, it's more likely to be forgotten, which is, yeah, I'm not entirely convinced. And certainly, like you say, there are there are good examples in other places where that doesn't actually work. But I mean, if you think, for example, so again, I'm still trying to find my feet in in Bengal, in, in Bangla and Cholik Gun. But if you think about somewhere else like uh, Western India, if you look at Rajasthan, for example, you know, you had lots of um, hereditary communities, Charan Bhatt, et cetera, whose, whose profession and practice was to develop long recitations of genealogies, family histories, the, um, the stories, the histories of, of their patron family, their Shraidatta family, the patron family. Um, and of course, what happened after independence was a lot of these um, families couldn't continue paying the Charan and Butt families in the same way. So a lot of people lost their pensions. And so at that point, they had this, this challenge, you know, what do I do with all of this stuff that we've remembered generation after generation, these family histories, if actually people don't need it anymore, or if they can't pay for it. So this has been a big problem for, for folk music heritage, because some kind of music sells and I will say the word sells as folk music and other things like listing the LinkedIn credentials of your patron's family. It doesn't work as folk music in the same way. So loss has been lost um, hugely. So what I'm saying is it does work a bit in Rajasthan where, for example, if your song is about an 18th century Raja of your local Zamindar, chances are it does get forgotten and excluded. Whereas if you have songs from the 1940s that are talking about um, Gandhi and the independence movement. Those are the kinds of songs that will continue now and can be used again and again. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. In a, in, a, in a way, it doesn't have to be anonymous to survive, but obviously you need to have a receptive political environment where people say, yes, we do want to remember that guy, but we don't actually care about him anymore. Um, and when it's a god, it's even more complicated. I think a historical god like modern Mohan. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. All right. So um, we have a question from Fozia. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's hello. It's nice listening to you. I can connect to this very much. I've tried lately. Oh, cool. David, can you mute yourself? Oh, there we go. I think it's done. Okay, right. So um, lately I've tried to write a poem describing a historical event while attending an art residency on the history of the Dulbashi Jamin Darbari in Naugal. My question is, do you know, do you think that if we now try to re rewrite history in this old poetic manner, it would be easier to memorize, given the fact that we're losing mm -hmm. sort of the stories rap rapidly? So the benefits. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I obviously, as you can see, I love this kind of material. So it's really exciting to hear that, that you're writing poetry about this. And that's that's really exciting. That's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, ho hopefully I'll hopefully I'll hear more at some stage. Um, I suppose now the big question, I mean, what, what you're asking is very interesting because it's not just, you know, what's the value of this kind of poetry but but what can it do for us what can it do for us in terms of remembering things i suppose one of the big concerns that that we all have is what is the place for this kind of poetry now who's going to hear it how are they going to hear it you know this particular text it is still circulating that booklet exists etc People are picking up on it. They're writing blogs about it. So it is in circulation, but it's still a bit limited, obviously, compared to other things. I mean, I'm hoping that things like social media will hugely improve poetry um, circulation 
And I'm hoping that things like social media will kind of give us a bit of a revival of oral literature again, um, because I think a lot of people now are, are getting a bit tired of reading and they're more and they are more open to the idea of watching a TikTok video or something of someone reciting. And I think there, I think so. I think before, particularly in this country, you know, there was a bit of anxiety about poetry. It was seen as very elite and and on the way out. But I'm hoping that now things like social media will allow more people to listen and engage with spoken word and poetry, etc. So, so yes, I mean, that would be a really interesting project um, to kind of, you know, think about history through poetry again. Uh, hello, Richard. Uh, this is Fozia here. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I was saying, like, not only just recite, what, what I did, actually, it was the Porto Chitro. Uh, oh. uh, it was included, the Porto Chitro was there. So, and it was anonymous because... Uh, when we did the exhibition afterwards, I heard people saying, this is our old song. She, she drew the you know, pictures. And I said nothing because if they can own it, just let, I let them own it. And uh, there's no problem because if they find, because after all, it's their history. It was their story. And it was uh, all, again about a deity with, uh, uh, cause, um, his, uh, his name, uh, her name was Raj Rajeshri. Is uh, uh, one of the, I think, uh, it's like uh, Devi Durga, but mm -hmm. uh, it was named Raj Rajeshwari. Uh, and so we just, so it was an art um, residency. So we did it like that. We just had an idea. Let's, because it was a broken zamindar body. And we really had to, uh, like, we searched for three months to get those uh, stories because they are forgotten almost. So we just, uh, we collected them. So when you're talking about this, um, you know, uh, like social media, I think in incorporating them with pictures, like port and everything, because, you know, Facebook and Instagram, it's all about pictures and people love to see the pictures and it's easier for them because when you use these old words, when you try to use these old words, most of the time people don't understand. But uh, if you have seen the port, Bangladeshi Porto Chitro, these are so simplistic drawing that anyone can relate to it. That they understand, okay, something this happening, it's not very uh, like abstract, it's very simple answer. So it's just, 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 uh, just shared my phone. That's fantastic. And it, the website that you put in the chat, is that the project you're talking about, that one? Yes, that one. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'll definitely look this up. This is fantastic. It's really, oh. I love portal teacher, <laughs> so it's really exciting to hear that you're working on this. This is great. Yeah, I, I said I wrote it in Bangla, and then we actually exhibited the uh, the whole project. It's Uromto is a residential art uh, community. We they, it like travels from uh, place to place, and this is the Uromto thing, you know, like mm -hmm. flying. So, and uh, we we actually focused uh, focus on the. Uh, you know, like lost stories of Jamindar Baris. We are more interested in Jamindar Baris and broken ones. You know, people don't know about them much. Uh, so oh. we just try to restore the stories in different artistic manner. And people, uh, artists from all over the world, they come and they do their thing. If you go to the website, you will find many other work. But my work is a bit like on your face. Like it was like very straightforward, the poetry and the picture. So, so it, was kind of represented um, the whole project in Dhaka Art Summit where, where we get all the uh, artistic things in. and so this is why I uh, lit later I uh, actually translated it again in poetic form um, so if you go there you'll find it fantastic I will definitely have a look this is this is really exciting and it's so good to hear people are trying to find these kind of local histories and and try to work yeah. with them so brilliant thank you thank you so much <laughs> Okay. Yeah, nice to everyone. Um, Ahmadullah has a question. Well, I want to ask you, Richard, you mentioned uh, briefly about um, salt marching, right? Yes. Now, you know, um, I mean, why salt marching, right? I know, um, I know salt played an important role in, in the history of the subcontinent, especially with Gandhi's, uh, you know, thing and Roy Moxham wrote about a book 
called Great Hedge of India, yeah. where he talked about the British erecting a several more than thousand miles uh, barrier, you know, mm -hmm. um, to prevent s smuggling of salt. And is and Robert Clive he himself, you know, tried to uh, create a salt monopoly for the East India Company mm -hmm. to stop the uh, abuses, you know, by East India Company officers. Uh, you know, to prevent them from engaging in private trade and use, to use the money from the salt monopoly to pay higher salary. So why, why they mentioned salt uh, uh, merchant? Why not say textile merchant or some other kind of merchant? Any particular reason you think? Yeah, um, interesting. So, I mean, Gokulchon, it, so yeah, like you say, really interesting. First of all, that um, that there is this very specific context around around the the merchants in Kolkata in that period, etc. The fact that you know um, the money from Gokul Chandra Mitra goes to the someone who will be able to intervene with the divan, who will be able to intervene with the company. You know, there's a company background to all of this going on, but. Um, the in short i mean the reason why salt merchant is because he was he was real so this was a historical event that happened and so yeah gokul chandra mitro um was a real person who was a salt merchant and that's where he made his fortune um and so that's why they they talk about uh salt in all of these sources purely because it was him i'm trying to in my longer version i do talk about where he came from but i'm i'm scrolling through and it's not it's not my memory is not very good so it's not really springing to mind um per se but yeah in in brief it's because it, um these were historical things but then of course uh yeah sorry let me see i'm just scanning through my text yeah so he gokul chandra mitra was the son of Shitaram mitra who had cleared land and built a house in Bag Bazaar in Kolkata and had made a fortune dealing in salt and peace goods with the East India Company. So again, you know, this is someone who really had made his fortune by working with, with the company originally. And again, you know, he's there because, because this was a historical event, but it's also interesting from our point of view, looking back at it, that you have the god in Bishnupur, which in the 18th, early 18th century was doing so well. He's there with the kind of old classic elites, the Rajas, the Malas, but then he moves to Kolkata and actually power, trade, everything also move, is moving away from places like Bishnupur. And it's all kind of gravitating towards Kolkata, towards men like Gokul Chandra, who do have these connections to the company. So yeah, I think it's very interesting because it is a story about social change, political change in this period, as much as being about a real salt merchant. Yeah. Great. I'm just looking around just to see if there's any hands up or there's no further questions from the audience. I think we can come to a close and I want to thank Richard for a really wonderful talk and I look forward to seeing this develop um, and being turned oh, yeah to, I look forward to seeing this develop and thank you to the audience for being here um, on Tuesday evening and giving your time and being so engaged that was wonderful um, so yeah thanks Richard and thanks thank to you. the audience yeah thank just, you everyone thank you so much just before you go uh, tomorrow evening same time, London time, 6.30. We have uh, Maria Holtrop. You know, she's a cu curator of history. Mm -hmm. um, museum, I can't pronounce it, Reich Museum or something like that, in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, they have a, there's one, I think there's a message there. I don't know if there's a question. Currently, uh, there is, oh no, right. currently they have a major exhibition on slavery uh, mm -hmm. in there. And, before, a uh, couple of years ago, they were in contact with me because they wanted to cover the story of Bengali slavery in the 17th century when the Dutch took uh, thousands of Bengalis you know, to their Indonesian, um, expanding Indonesian empire. Um, but that story is not really known. 
So Maria, she's going to be talking about the story of the Dutch taking Bengali slave in the two different places, Indonesia, Japan, China, sorry, Macau, um, and South Africa. So do come, uh, it's uh, 6.30. If you haven't booked, um, then please book and tell all your friends. We have uh, had a good response, so it should be a nice uh, uh, session tomorrow. And thank you, Richard, and thank you, Laila Udin, and thanks. Uh, I think somebody is just trying to join. We we'll just let him join, and then we we'll say goodbye. To him. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sure. He's not joined yet. <laughs> oh yes, right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Um, we'll see Richard again, and this will be uploaded on uh, YouTube hopefully tonight. Thank oh, wow. you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Huge thanks, and thanks again, Mamadou Mandela. Thank you, Laili. Okay, right.